Testing one, two, one, two, live from the basement. What's happening? What the hell? How about that? What the hell is wrong with this thing? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of uh, What's Not on My Desk because I'm still at home quarantining from COVID. According to the CDC, I have to stay home till this Friday. I could technically go back to work on Friday, but I decided to take the Friday off sort of stick around for the weekend just to make sure that the people at my office are safe. Let's talk about COVID for a second. Not as bad as some of my colleagues and friends that have had it, I gotta be honest with you. There was a day when I was plastered, I had a fever, some sniffles, lost my sense of smell. Feels really weird. No, I've never had that happen to me before, so it feels really weird. Didn't lose my sense of taste still, so coffee's, I can still taste my coffee. Not to downplay COVID, uh, overall, I'd say my personal experience wasn't so bad, thank God for that. Uh, so, I don't really have any watches to show you outside of maybe showing my wife's collection or some of the pieces I have at home, which you guys have already seen. So I decided just to chat about some topics, sort of like a QA, and a but not, I guess. Uh, I guess the first topic on hand is going to be the 5711 being discontinued. What was the first thing that came to my mind when 5711 was discontinued? The first thing I said is good for Paddock and finally. And the biggest reason I say that is because that's a watch that I felt that was pricing itself out of the market. A lot of B2B business, but not a whole lot of guys out there putting those wristwatches on their wrist for around that $70,000 price range pre-discontinuation. And let me explain. What was starting to happen is you had guys out there retail clients out there, and I've seen this happen before in 07 and early 08 before the crisis, going out there solely buying the 5711 stainless steel for the purpose of reselling it rather than putting it on their wrist. Not everyone, but most. Paddock obviously saw all that. It's not a good thing when you have a model or a few models from a brand, whatever brand it might be, that starts to price itself out of the market, meaning that it becomes not feasible for an average watch collector, right? A watch that's already trading a double list. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, you can continue pumping them out and continue making your money, which is what they did in 08 with models like the 5960, the 5970s, and things of that nature. That's what was the hottest at the time. Nautiluses were also hot in 07, early 08, but some of the higher end stuff was just as hot, right? Today, mm, not so much. It's very hard to sell anything from the Grand Complication Collection from Paddock, and oftentimes you find that stuff discounted, which they don't like either. So you just continue to watch. Now they know that short term, the prices will go even more through the roof, which they did. Today market price in a brand new 5711, a 2020, is gonna set you back about 105,000. I've seen guys on the chats asking as high as 110. Uh, we just sold a 5711 uh, that was dated, uh, I wanna say 2015, 16 maybe. Uh, we sold that watch for $92,000 to a dealer. Right, so hundred thousand dollar price range, right? And how did that happen? It literally happened instantly. The minute it was announced that the watch is officially discontinued, all the dealer chats, people started posting stuff: a hundred, one hundred five, one hundred and ten. Some guys, a joke, posted one up for five hundred thousand with a Tiffany dial. Right? Again, discontinued immediately, prices through the roof, as it happens with pretty much any paddock that has ever gotten discontinued. So you're asking yourself, well, how did that? That's kind of counterintuitive. How did that help paddock, right? Well, it did and it didn't, right? Initially, it didn't, obviously. They expected the prices to go through the roof, but now it's okay. Now it's warranted, so to speak. Hope you understand where I'm going with this. This watch was heading for that $100,000 mark. It's, it was only a matter of another, a matter of time, maybe another year or so that watch would have gotten there. That would be bad for business with Paddock, right? What do I foresee as the future of this watch? Because I know you guys, because I know that's the first question that's going to come to your mind. Well, you got to consider the 6711 or whatever the new plain Jane Nautilus is going to be, if there's going to be a new one. The minute that one comes out, instantly it's going to be double list, no question about it. Let's say they came out with a new Nautilus. A it gives them the opportunity to increase the retail on that, and they can increase it significantly. Rather than going from a dollar to let's say a dollar ten or a dollar seven as they normally would, now they can jump from a dollar to let's say a dollar thirty, a dollar forty. And the reason they can do that is because it's a new model, it may have a new movement, it may, ha it may have a slew of things to allow them to give, them to give them the excuse to make that additional margin. And the reason for that, they know the market can handle it. They saw what the 5711s were trading for. That may have been part of their reason to discontinue the damn thing and say, look, you know what? We're gonna come out with a new one 
and we're just gonna price it 30% more so that we can make more money because there still be a waiting list a mile long for people wanting to buy the new one. When the new one, and if the new one comes out, what will happen to the 5711s in terms of price? I think that they're gonna continue trading right now at that $100,000 price range. And it all depends on timing. It all depends on how fast they're gonna come out with it. Uh, it all depends on what the new one is gonna be priced at, obviously. But at the same token, uh, it's a timing thing. If they're not gonna announce the new 57 or 6711 or whatever it might be, so let's say over the next year, the prices of the 5711s are gonna hold steady. Uh, what's my prediction? And you know, and you guys know I hate making predictions, but I think that once they do announce the new a Nautilus, the new plane Nautilus, I think that you're going to see a dip of 15 to 20 percent, which will take the price of the 5711 still above that 70, 65 to 70 thousand dollar price range that we're trading at before they announce the discontinuation of the watch. So, so probably we'll come back down to that 80 to 90 thousand dollar price range if that makes sense. I never thought that the 5711 at the prices they were trading at are a good buy. I've always said the same thing, buy what you like first and foremost, and if the market price is 70,000 and that's the watch you really want, then that's the watch that you buy. Alternatives, well how about, I've told you guys numerous times, the 3700 Paddock, the original from the 70s, right, 1974 is when Jeff had designed this watch. There's still 3700s out there anywhere from 100 to $150,000 depending on condition, how complete they are. If the original 3700 came in a cork box, I'll have Ian throw that up there. Uh, that box alone is anywhere from 15 to $20,000. That's why the range fluctuates from 100 to 175. Then of course there's the condition of the dial, condition of the watch overall how polished or unpolished it was uh, service records papers etc etc but that to me is a better buy first of all for somebody that says oh I'm not into vintage and I've heard this numerous times to guys that asked me for 5711 I ended up selling them at 3700 I tell them well why don't you put the two watches side by side what's the difference with the exception of the open back there is no difference it's the same exact watch size wise looks wise etc if you get one in good condition for all intents and purposes people will think you're wearing a 5711 but think about how many 3700s they made versus how many 5711s are out there. It's night and day. I'm willing to bet it's one to 50 ratio, if not one to 100, right? And watch these things in the next six months to a year, if the market conditions stay the same, they're gonna go over the $200,000 mark. Uh, if you're out there considering buying a 5711, saying, well, now it's 100% discontinued, I'm gonna bite the bullet, I'll pay an extra 20 grand or 30 grand or whatever it might be to buy one, consider the 3700. But if the 5711 is the watch you really, really want, uh, especially now you got guys out there looking for ones that are dated 2020, which is the last per year of production, which I've told you guys before when it comes to collectibles, it works, then by all means to go out there and get that one and before i finish talking about the 5711 got a pop and bernie that's a great meme right there and guess what at this point that meme is no longer true because you can no longer wait for 5711 although i'm sure there'll be some delivered in 2021 as well for those that were waiting because production doesn't just stop abruptly there's still pieces being delivered to dealers that have them on order stop the pressures <gasps> Enough about that, let's talk about the Zaytona, right? That's right, I said it, the Zaytona, the new Zenith Chrono Master Sport. I've gotten a tremendous amount of questions from you guys in regards to Zenith as an alternative to those watches that have priced themselves out of the market, i.e. the stainless steel Daytona. Spoiler alert, I will tell you, Zenith has always been a great alternative to a sports watch, be it a Paddock, be it an AP, be it a Rolex. It's always, always has been a great alternative, especially if we're talking about the famous El Primero movement, right? You have to consider that the Zenith El Primero movement is in the position of being the most significant horological development ever. Big statement. Developed in 1969 as one of the first automatic chronograph movements out there, right? Hence the name El Primero, right? First. High frequency movement, 36,000 VPH, the famous tri-complex layout. Of course, 2019 brought the caliber 3600. Increased power reserve, 60 hours, pretty impressive. Of course, the hacking function and ability to measure one tenth of a second, also very impressive. So enter the Chrono Master Sport. Let's throw that up on the screen. Uh-oh. And why I had started this conversation with the new Zaytona is the first thing you're gonna say is, oh my God, Roman, 
the bracelet. Oh my God, the ceramic bezel. Oh my God, the pushers. Oh my God, everything looks like a Daytona. Well, right off the bat, I'll tell you the buttons. Look at the original Zenith uh, from 1969. Buttons look more or less the same. The layout of the dials, obviously. The ceramic bezel, jumping on a bandwagon. But are they really jumping on a bandwagon of the Daytona? Not really. The ceramic was used by various brands. If anything, I would give credit to AP before I would give credit to Rolex because Rolex themselves jumped on the bandwagon of ceramic bezels. Any sports chronograph out there on a bracelet, it's going to look like a Daytona. Is this something that they purposely did? Again, going back to what I said about ceramic, no. If everybody else in the industry is using ceramic, let's use ceramic. The, these are guys that can confidently say, like, hey guys, you can call me the Daytona, the Zaytona all you want, but we made this watch since 1969 and been improving it for 40 plus years, right? This is our stuff. And with this thing being priced around $10,000, is it an alternative to Daytona? Absolutely it is. There's a lot of guys out there that are saying that, look, I'm not paying $28,000 for a stainless steel Daytona, and I think a Zenith El Primero, especially this guy, is a great alternative, and I'm gonna agree with that. Because look, if you're someone that's into a good chronograph, how iconic is the El Primero movement? How iconic is that particular chronograph being one of the first? You make a conscious decision to buy the nuts and bolts, to buy a company with plenty of history, and I think I did a video on the history of Zenith, if I'm not mistaken. But here lies the issue, and it's that mental block, right? Chrysler 300, I think, came out a few years back. People said it really, it's really reminiscent of a small Bentley, right? And the mental block comes in where? If you're someone that's out there that bought himself a 300, and in the back of your head, you have that, oh, this sort of looks like a Bentley, but it's not. It's, you know, one-tenth of a price or whatever it might be. It's going to be the same mental block with this watch. Bell & Ross came out with that new watch that sort of looked like a mix-up of a Nautilus or an AP or whatever it was. It's a good-looking watch, right? It's a well price watch, I think the skeleton version was like five or $6,000, right? Some people bought it and some people weren't buying it for the simple reason that A, it looked like a funky hybrid. The Gerard Perigo skeletons that I've showed on my show, again, reminiscent of the AP skeleton double balance, but it's not. And this is what happens. This is when companies that are popular today tend to take the upper hand uh, in situations such as these. Because remember, all these guys, they all copy off of each other. So, but because the brand image today is that being hot, again, and today we're talking about Rolex, AP, Paddock, Richard Mille, right? Those are your four brands, right? That are sort of in the runnings, right? Now let's take Richard Mille out of it because they're completely different from everybody else, even though they have plenty of stuff that they copied off other brands themselves. And when you're on top, you can get away with anything. If Zenith was the brand to be today, if Zenith was in that number one spot and Rolex was in spot number 10, the conversation would have been different. It would say, oh my God, did you see what Rolex did with their Daytona? They blatantly copied Zenith's Chrono Master Sport. But the bottom line is, is that if you're someone that can appreciate the El Primero movement, if you're somebody that can appreciate the history behind uh, Zenith, and most importantly, if you can look past the fact that nine out of 10 people are gonna say, oh my God, that's a Daytona wannabe, then you go out there and buy that. But if you can't get past that point, then maybe this is not an alternative for you because in the back of your head, you're still gonna be saying, hey, I wanted a Bentley, but I'm driving a Chrysler 300. A lot of the popular boys, to go back to the conversation of the 5711, have priced themselves out of the market, and these other companies are taking advantage of it by producing high quality watches, such as the Chrono Master Sport, and selling them to the public at a third of the price of a comparable watch from a hot brand. And speaking of alternatives, right? Omega, the new Omega Speedmaster, complete brand new redesign. Uh, you're gonna say, wait a minute, Roman, it doesn't look a whole lot different. Well, according to Omega, they redesigned everything about it. But by looking at this picture myself, I'm saying to myself, well, it doesn't look like a far throw from the original models, right? Obviously, the main thing about it, it, it is still NASA flight qualified. So yes, you can take that watch to the moon again. I know that the diehard uh, Speedy fans out there are indeed happy because at the end of the day, the Speedy is the crown jewel of Omega. This is the Paddock Nautilus of the brand. They kind of needed to tread carefully while updating this watch, because this, again, be, this being their jewel, and they couldn't really go very, very drastic, because that would result in rejection from, you know, those diehard Speedy followers. And there's millions of them out there throughout the world, myself included, right? So the, so the difficult task was to modernize the model without, again, pissing off 
the fans in, in lamest terms, right? It's a subtle difference in the bezels and the pushers and the dials and, and, and the bracelet and things of that nature that make all the difference for a speedy collector. And if you guys are one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Much like with Rolex, you get really, really geeky with certain dials, with certain hands, with certain writings on a dial and so on and so forth. It's the same for Omega, it always has been. But to go back to the original topic where I talked about alternatives, to me, this is a hell of an alternative to a sports chronograph. Uh, I know the question is going to come up, which would I go with, the new Speedmaster or the Zenith Zaytona? Uh, I would still go with the Speedmaster because, as I told you guys before, I love Omega's role in space exploration. Would I own both? Absolutely. But Speedy would be, to me, would be a better alternative to a popular sports chronograph, if you ask. So the last topic I wanted to talk about is Hublot. Hublot? What the f***? Specifically, we're going to talk about the Takashi Murakami watch, right? Created a lot of buzz on social media. But before I get into that, let's talk about the AD video. So a lot of you guys comments. Some of you guys even dubbed that AD as being me. So I want to set the rumor straight. No, it wasn't me sitting in the dark and changing my voice, pretending to be an AD. It was an actual AD that was in my office. Obviously, I will not reveal the AD's identity. And you guys can simply take my word for it that no, it was not me <laughs> pretending to be an authorized dealer. It was an actual authorized dealer that came into the office. I was actually on the sidelines watching that interview take place as Adrian and taped it. I guess the only mistake was is maybe it should have been me and Adrian together in frame interviewing this AD, but I told you guys before, I don't have anything to prove to anybody. If you believe that that was me masquerading as an AD, uh, by all means, feel free to believe so, but I did want to address the comments in the video where some people thought that it was either fake or it was me, or we just stuck a random person in there to answer those questions. No, it was not. Uh, if you look at the video, you'll notice that, uh, yes, we did prepare those questions, um, uh, but I prepared them together with Adrian, which is why Adrian wasn't really reading the questions. He was just kind of spitting them off the top of his head. And there was not a whole lot of cuts in that video. It was literally an interview. And the AD actually answered those questions off the cuff. We didn't make him preview to those questions. And you can kind of tell because he would stumble in some of the questions. But enough about that. For those of you who think that that was me behind that video, it was not. And perhaps next time I do something like this to prove a point, I'll sit in on the interview just the same. Let's talk about Hublot and artists. Richard Orlinsky, Mark Ferrero, Shepard Fairley, just to mention a few. Uh, these are some of the artists that Hublot had associated themselves with, and now they added Mr. Smiley Flower. Quoting Murakami, he says, sometimes collaboration with watch companies only involve printing on the packaging. So I used to say I would collaborate only if I can be fully involved. But I knew that was never an option, and I just kept saying no. When I first saw the watch, I think the first place I saw it was actually on Instagram. It was Hublot's video. I didn't really notice the smiling right, flower right away, and I kind of wish that it wasn't an old black. I kind of wish that the flower itself had either different stones or a painted flower. Uh, but nevertheless, it's sort of there and not there. Maybe the design process behind it was to have it done in such a way to where it's kind of subdued and not in your face. I don't know what went into the mind of the artist and Hubler at the same token. He was involved throughout the entire process of the design and this is on him. This is how he decided and as I say, the art is in the eye of the beholder. So, of course, the watch is dynamic or it moved, right? And at first when I saw the video uh, from Hublot, I thought that that movement was attached, had something to do with the rotor and it was attached to the rotor. It was actually a ball bearing system that they designed to allow the pedals to sort of move back and forth and have the smiley face <clears throat> sort of stay put in the center. And the idea was is that as you were in the watch, it's constantly moving it, so it's constantly eye catching. Which to me, again, I wish that at least the center of the flower, the flower itself was somehow uh, forget, maybe just not use black diamonds, maybe use black and white diamonds. I think it would be a little bit more catchy. But again, who am I to tell the artist what to do, right? Obviously, a limited edition, surprise, surprise. They made 200 of them. Retail price on the watch is 27,000 change, I think 27.3, which I think is very reasonable for what the watch is uh, and what the watch represents. Is this something that's going to be popular? Yes. Takashi Murakami has a humongous following as an artist, so I think this was definitely a good collab to do because he is very popular till this day. What I have found in the past is that 
The art collector is not necessarily somebody who is a watch collector. And oftentimes you'll notice that the value on a timepiece will not be the same as the value on a piece of art that particular artist may have created. Uh, so I guess only time will show. This watch just came out. I already have a bunch of requests for it. I haven't gotten one yet. Uh, will I find myself uh, stocking these pieces if the opportunity presents itself? Yes, I will because A, it's a good looking watch, and B, we already have requests for it. Uh, odds are they'll may come out with different variations of this, depending on how successful these 200 models are. I have no doubt they'll sell out for the company. How well would they do in the market? Only time will show. But I certainly see future collabs in color, and maybe ladies watch, et cetera. Like that came out in the ladies version, with, and with the flower being colorful, that's something I would actually buy for my wife. So in conclusion, I am gonna read another quote from Takashi. When I visited the Hublot manufacturer in Switzerland, for the first time, I realized to what extent the traditional know-how, precision, futuristic technology, and craftsmanship were all intertwined in the creation of a watch. Bringing my art into the creativity of these watchmakers represents a unique adventure for me. He's not the kind of guy to do something just to do it, so he really had to be inspired by a visit to a watch factory. If any of you guys have ever been to a watch factory and you are a watch collector or watch fanatic or whatever it may be, you should know exactly how he must have felt when he first stepped foot into the factory. Well, guys, that's going to conclude today's uh, Not What's On My Desk, COVID edition. I told you guys before, you know, making these videos, they take time out of my week. And if I don't tape on a weekly basis, I will fall behind and you guys won't have any content. So I'm going to tape another Q&A from home just to ensure that I have that content for you to guys to look at week in, week out as you used to. Other than that, thanks for tuning in. I should be back in the office next week and be done with this COVID nonsense. Uh, like, share, subscribe, do all those wonderful things. And uh, I'll see you guys next week for more watch reviews and other videos.